If I want to add something, that's like your end. We have a new partnership happening here. So. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the first workshop of the 2018-19 Green Subsidies Workshop Series. Um, typically we start in September, but this year uh, we were involved with the State Fair a lot, and so there was, um, kind of felt like that served its, its own uh, workshop purposes, and so we took September off, and we're starting in October, and uh, I'm really excited about this particular workshop because it happens to coincide with um, a uh, visit from the German de delegation of those cities that are participating in the Climate Smart Municipality Program, which, if you went to the State Fair, was also highlighted um, in the Eco Experience Building as well. Um, so some of you may have had a taste of what this program is. Um, but today we really want to give you a bit more of a sense of what's been going on with the Climate Smart Municipality Program, what it is, why it's important, um, uh, and, and how you can start to get involved and, and be a part of the conversation as well. Um, so we're going to start kind of with the introductions. I'm Abby Finnis. I am with the Great Plains Institute and co-director of the Green Step Cities Program along with, oh look, Along with, mouth, so along with Philip time. Music, <laughs> make sure you grab two bagels. Um, Philip Music, I work with Abby. I'm over at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Oh, I'm Jenna Green. I'm at Great Plains Institute with Abby. I'm Bud Botany. I'm the I'm Sabine Engel. I'm uh, with the University of Minnesota Institute of the Environment. I am in charge of the International 
energy partnership in Germany, and we got kind of the principal investment data on the grant that supports the climate smart municipalities project. It's a project that is funded to a major degree by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs through their transatlantic program. And the uh, objective is to bring together Minnesotans and Germans on climate smart action based in municipalities and to see what cities of any size, any population uh, density, any economic structure, any location in Minnesota and North Carolina State can do in order to increase their resiliency, their uh, climate smart action, and how to learn from each other. The idea is that uh, being climate smart is economically beneficial and it will increase the quality of life for our citizens. And our um, thesis or our question, basic question is, does one need to be a particular type of community to be a winner in this transformation or not? The preliminary answer that we get from the Germans that are part of the program, all of them are uh, communities that are award-winning climate smart communities is no, one doesn't need to be of a particular kind. Anybody can do it. The ones who do it best are the ones who involve all of the different interests in this action from the start. So it's all about partnership between people and organizations. So Sabina is really the one who has spearheaded this effort and she put a tremendous amount of work and it's really it's really amazing to see kind of the progress that this program has been making the last few years and and really it's Sabina who's behind all of this and so you guys will get a glimpse of, along with partners and yeah I know you'll <laughs> go the, ahead. The, partners, <laughs> the Minnesota partners are um, absolutely essential so when you when you want to create change in your community everybody knows whom to call we can't do it alone and the same is true of this project. We have put together a list of uh, um, partners, leading, leading partners, the cities in Minnesota, the five cities that are part of it right now. So it's the city of Warren, the city of the Roof, the city of Alpha, the city of Mars, and the city of Rochester. We also understood from the start that we need politics to be involved, uh, the politicians representing the, those cities in their districts. Uh, we have the Great Plains Institute as a nonprofit organization working in this field. We have the Minnesota Credit Union Network in there. We have uh, Evergreen Energy as a business um, in the that space involved as well. And we also have state um, agencies involved the Department of Agriculture, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, uh, the Environmental Quality Board, the Department of Commerce. The list goes on. And the list is growing. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sabrina. Right. Uh, my name is Mike Miller. I'm with the Energy Agency of North Carolina State. I'm the Energy Committee for the Tech Energy Agency. Thank you. 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 My name is Hannes Batur, I'm from the town of Lüdenscheid and I'm head of the Department of uh, Environmental Protection, including climate protection and some other things. And I'm glad to be here. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kristen Moreau is the local government coordinator with the Environmental Quality Board. <clears throat> Uh, Peter Berger, I'm the Energy Efficiency and Insurance Coordinator for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Good morning, Peter Lindstrom, Clean Energy Resource Team and Mayor of the City of Buffalo. I'm the Environmental Specialist at the City of Woodbridge. Can 
Mary Herleman, um, Deputy Director of Public Works with the City of Bloomington and CCA Mentor Association. Uh, Andy Kinsella with the City of Rapids. I'm Kinsella Bednar, I work with the City of Elk River as the Environmental Coordinator. Lance Ram, I'm a, a local sustainable development manager with the City of Elk River. Uh, Jeff Hoffman, I'm the Director of Public Works with the City of Elk River. Uh, Jeff Hoffman, I'm the Director of Public Works with the City of Elk River. I'm going to get started right now. I'm going to focus on the implementation of the Fair and Point Principles. I'm going to talk about soil filtration, equity, and other issues. Um, I'm uh, John Crampton. I'm with the uh, Minnesota Division of the Isaac Walton League, uh, Bush Lake Chapter of the Isaac Walton League, Minnesota Valley Chapter of the Isaac Walton League, and Hope Road Presbyterian Church. Green Community. <laughs> um, Keith Stokowski with the City of North St. Paul. I'm the Parks Director. I'm Allie Hilcher, I'm the Environmental Specialist for the City of Minnesota. Susan Ash with the City of Bloomington, Environmental Specialist for the City of Minnesota. I'm Kevin Batsky, I'm a staff attorney here at the League, and I'm on the Environmental Commission in Miami. Uh, my name is Lindsay Anderson, I work at the Minnesota Department of Commerce, uh, just working on local government. Jim Hawkins, Jason Berry, and the City Thank you all for coming. We also have some folks um, on the webinar. Um, so welcome to them. There is a little chat bar or a Q&A um, box at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions throughout um, the presentations, you can just click on that and then we'll, we'll address those here. Um, all right, let's get started. So we are going to hear from um, the partner cities of Elk River and Easterloan today, uh, talking about some electric vehicle work that both of those cities have been doing. Um, uh, as well as um, I'll hear from Dr. Baron Bartunek uh, about innovation and transportation um, that he's been working on. And then Larry Herkey will be coming later on to talk about what um, the Department of Admin has been doing around, around fleets. They have a fleet action plan, so he'll give us some updates on that. Um, before we get started, I'm going to quickly, this is where are we? This is where we get into the hiccups. It will the slide work. Um, so I have been very fortunate to be uh, involved in this program, um, especially in the first two years. Uh, I got to travel with the delegation to Germany um, and, and learn about this program. And so as Sabina uh, framed up, the program is really rooted in how can, how can local uh, governments learn from each other, share their innovations, and move forward on local climate action in a way that benefits your local economy uh, and benefits your quality of life. So those are all kinds of things that are intertwined with what Green Step Cities is about and improving the quality of life and in the way that you kind of tailor for yourself and, and thinking about these other um, environmental concerns as well and, and the impact that you can have on that. Um, so we, we traveled around Northwest or North Rhine, Westphalia, um, and just looking at all of the kind of things that are popping up there and, and, and the innovation that is being bred, um, um, you know, also from this program as, as folks share with each other, but also what's been going on on the ground um, uh, in various places. And so you can kind of see the, the bike infrastructure that happens in different cities is incredible. And you know, you think you have good bike infrastructure in Minneapolis and then you go to Munster and, and there's bikes everywhere. There's parking garages for bikes. Um, there's amazing pathways. Um, and so it's just, it's really kind of cool and eye opening to be able to see that. And then in return, you know, the, the Germans can come here and, and see what's going on here. Cause there are a lot of really amazing things that cities are doing that you all are doing in your communities. And, you know, as we work together and we share from each other, we share with each other, um, I think that we can accelerate and advance um, what we're working on so that we can, we can achieve that, that sustainable future um, for all of us. And, this is an example of Zarbeck, Germany, um, which is a small community. So it goes back to Sabina's point that, you know, you don't have to be the large municipalities. You can be a community of 8,000 people. And what they did in 2008 or nine or so, they set a goal to be energy independent by 2030. They achieved that in 2015 and they're still going. Um, and they produce something like 350% of the electricity they consume. And so the, the things that seem like they're not possible are possible and they're achievable. And I think that, you know, through this program, through this partnership, that we can really start to see that and, and really accelerate a lot of this work um, in Minnesota, in Germany, 
um, and then and then beyond. So um, I don't know. Does anybody have any questions to start? Otherwise, we can kind of start getting into into the presentations. All right. So I think Amanda is going to be up first. Um, also, I do want to note we have these brochures that give you more background on the program and what folks are doing. So I think there are a couple floating around the room. And um, so take a look at that. It really is a rich program um, with lots of information. So we can share these brochures and we can share them online with folks as well. Oh, okay. I'm going to start. First of all, thank you that I can be here that I was invited and to give you some information. My English is not so good, so perhaps um, it is a little bit difficult for me to give all the information I wanted to give you, but I try. And Sabina and Dan and all of you can help me. So um, I'm glad to have this partnership with Ed Weber and we talk about interesting themes. Um, even in uh, our city, we have um, this big theme, electric um, mobility. We talk about um, mobility change in Germany. It's um, very, very yeah, interesting and it's hard for our cities. Uh, what is going on in the next five, ten years? Um, first of all, I want to give you some um, thoughts. I hope so. <laughs> Um, the question is why is electromobility important for the city? I think it is the same here in the US we have to ask you. And um, what we know is about 20% of the CO2 emissions are generated by road traffic. Um, this is the average value in Germany and also in our city in Berlin. I don't know. What is the value of your cities? Minnesota. That's what we talk about. Um, we know car exhaust is harmful to health. We also know electric cars cause less noise, so this is good when um, the city center. Um, and the electricity for cars can be generated by Originally was renewable energy and can be stored. Tom and I we discussed <laughs> for a few minutes about it um, because it's important for the local value creation. Um, we have no oil, I think, here in Minnesota. We do, and in our uh, in North Australia, we have to import it. So this is a big chance for us. First of all, the background for Germany. I think it's important to know what's going on in Germany and why um, do we have to do on and to think about uh, electric uh, mobility. And later on, I think Ben about to have a little more information about uh, this uh, theme. Even uh, you have to know uh, that the European Union legislations and sanitary emission <coughs> reduction targets for the cars by 2021, based from when the weight average to be achieved by all new cars and 25 grams of CO2 per kilometer. This means um, the um, question mark? Car, car producer um, has to think about what can do, and they will only reach this aim when they have more cars. They thought about diesel, but it's not the uh, aim now. More diesel. In Germany, uh, you heard about this problem, I think. <laughs> a little um, bit. Yeah. A little money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this theme is out. And now they have to think about electric vehicle. Um, yes, car producers will produce numbers of new electric cars. We know this uh, over the next five years. We want to prepare our cities for much more electric cars, which will be coming on the market. And for if you know, you have to know we have um, 94,000, about 94,000 inhabitants in Italy. And we have um, five years ago, 2013, 51,343 cars in total, and only 10 electric cars. 
and now we have 52,952 cars in total and 45 electric cars. This is much more than 10, but uh, we think about 45 electric cars, but in the future, we know it will grow, grow, grow. And um, what will these numbers mean for you? One question, are this 45 cars only private cars? Or? Not only. Even owned by, by companies. Company. The most are also pretty uh, limited. It's in total. Yeah. <laughs> mobility, we think mobility is changing fast. And when will electric mobility prevail? Uh, when there is a greater variety of vehicles, when there is a sufficient charging possibilities, when the cars become cheaper, of course, when the range of the vehicles increases, and what does the future of mobility look like? I think I uh, um, told you about uh, this mobility change, <coughs> electric, networked, autonomous, and shared. And uh, the estimate is by 2025, 20 to 40% of the which range we don't know, uh, of new cars will be electric. Now, to us um, in Isanoon, we have uh, in front, um, I told you about our baseline 10% of the CO2 emissions are generated by road traffic. We know, um, uh, in summary, what have we done until now? We created a group electric mobility action plan now for the city. We found electric. Uh, found an electromobility network with uh, even car dealers, important persons. Um, since 2016, host annual community activity day on electric mobility. So we have every year such a day where all the um, inhabitants can come to and have uh, contact to the car dealers and they show all their cars, the electric cars they have, and they can drive them. And this is important to drive. And when they uh, drove those cars, they get, get out of the cars and they're always smiling. <laughs> it's interesting to see because it's so good. I don't know if you have ever drove a zero drove an electric vehicle. Did you? Yeah. So I think it's the same when you get out and drove it. <laughs> <laughs> we offer now free parking for electric cars in our city. Parking lots. Uh, we installed now a total of 18 charging stations in public areas, and our target in 2019 we want to add another 50 charging stations and to chain additional electric cars for our city administration. So, that is all. Uh, now, Amanda and Tommy will tell you more about Elk River and our event plan. Uh, um, so I'm Amanda, I work for the city of Elk River and New Zealand has been our partner for the last three years. So this is a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, I'm newer to my position, Kristen actually started at Elk River with this and Tom's been part of all this, so we'll kind of let him talk through. Um, you can start this week. Uh, we did uh, just a little background. We kind of started our electric vehicle initiative back in 2016. We applied for a grant from American Public Power Association. We received a grant from them to research uh, electric vehicles as part of our fleet and part of the city's fleet. So included in that grant, we, we received $40,000 from APPA for that. Included in that was a, a grant to do uh, an analysis of fleet vehicles. Elk River Municipal were kind of small. We didn't have 20 vehicles. So then again, we looked to the partnership. So we did uh, some city vehicles and then our fleet vehicles for the utility and not all of the fleet vehicles were included in that. But so we had 12 city vehicles and eight uh, utility vehicles and it, it tracked the uh, use, how, the, how all the vehicles were used for 
roughly nine months and it tracked uh, the miles driven, the stops, the starts, how people were driving. The trackers that were installed were really similar to what um, some insurance company used for safe driving and things like that. So really easy to administer. I went out and installed them in all the vehicles we tracked it. And then they produce analytics at the end of the nine months, which basically tell you <coughs> if an electric vehicle uh, is something that you could be looking at um, based on your driving patterns. So the results uh, were pretty, pretty interesting. We have a small service territory. So we, uh, 17 miles per day, uh, our, our service area, our city is only about 45 square miles. So when you're going to and from meetings, you don't necessarily have to go real far on a daily basis. Now there are those instances where we're driving to St. Paul or we're driving to Duluth where you do need a little bit more range, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So miles per gallon, 15 and 14, pretty much the same. Uh, average daily drive time, again, small service territory, not going from one end of the state to the other. So we're only driving the hour, uh, an hour a day or thereabouts, hour and a half and average speed 17 to 18 miles an hour. So based on just how vehicles were being driven, uh, we were a perfect fit so far. Uh, you look at the percent of idle time, uh, one kind of well-known fact in the state of Minnesota, if you're trying to get through Elk River on a Thursday or Friday, uh, it's horrible. We have horrible traffic uh, for a lot of people going north and we also have uh, very active train tracks. So you can sit for a few minutes but a, a bigger point is um, the vehicles that were used in this uh, fleet assessment, uh, we had uh, engineers, we had uh, linemen, foremen, we had people that were out in their vehicles for six out of the eight hour workday. And if you are, um, it's basically your office. So you're heating and cooling it. So there's a lot of idle time. When we first put that slide up, people were very concerned that people were letting those vehicles sit in the parking lot for two hours warming up. But then as you, you know, understand how people actually use the vehicle on a day-to-day -day basis, it made more sense. If it's 90 degrees out and you're reviewing a plant site, you're not going to be sitting in your vehicle sweltering. You're going to have it running with the air rock. So kind of getting um, below the actual stats really helps understand what's going on. So then at the end, it, it kind of spit out, um, that we had uh, 16 vehicles that were very, uh, they look good for doing electric vehicles. Now that was either uh, all electric battery or plug-in hybrid. And there was different uh, uh, savings associated with each one. But if you looked at the total cost savings, total cost of ownership, it was 76,000 for the best eight. And then if you included the next tier and those included like trucks being replaced with SUVs. Here again, just looking at how it's driven and where it's being driven and not how it's being used can be kind of misleading. That's one of the things that we took away from this Fleet Karma study. Uh, you, we have line soups that need to throw wheels of wire. They need to carry uh, heavy loads. They need to tow uh, larger loads. So based on mileage and, and how it's driven, it worked, but how it's actually used in the field not not so great but that kind of goes to a, a point a little bit later that amanda's going to hit on on something <clears throat> different that elk river did with the two types of vehicles that we're trying so and the other thing that we learned uh that we'll talk about is total cost of ownership in those numbers didn't include charging infrastructure and right now charging infrastructure is a huge hurdle uh for electric vehicles just based on the cost of installing them you can install um a level two charger, which is 240 volt uh, for $500. If you go out and buy one and install it yourself, or if you uh, install a DC fast charger that has 50 kW capacity, the one we installed was $66,000. Mm -hmm. So now if we're good, if we're gonna get, you know, here again, lesson learned, are we ever gonna get the payback on that particular uh, charging station? Chances are probably not, but where the real value comes from is people buying them, putting them in their home and using them. But without that infrastructure out there, people are not confident to buy it to drive more than 100, 120 miles a day. We, uh, I drive a Chevy Bolt, which 
has the longest range uh, for you know the Chevy vehicles at 238 miles. And I personally have experienced range anxiety without um, charging infrastructure. I drove it to Alexandria and essentially got stranded. Um, so that that cost of infrastructure is a big one, and that, that you know you spoke about the VW. That is a huge step into um, breaking down that barrier, but there's still a lot more that we can do. Um, so a little bit more about our charging infrastructure in Elk River. So as Tom mentioned, we are fortunate enough to get this grant and to partner with our utility to add. Um, we have two level two charging stations, both on city property, one's at our city hall and the other is in our downtown, which is the photo on the left. And then we do have the DC fast charger, which is um, on another busy corridor through our city at that Coburn's, right? Correct. So at a private business. Um, so for our city, the location is really critical. We have two major highways that go through the, south, the town, and now we do have chargers pretty much on both of them. And hoping to get another fast charger on 10 and as you're leaving Elk River. So that's been really important. Um, we are also fortunate that the utilities offers rebates for our residents if they're interested in adding an EV charger at their home. So that's level two. You can say um, how many we have now. Yeah, we started in 2016. We had two electric vehicles on our system. Now we have 10 and that's growing. I, you know, I have people calling about uh, rebates, the availability of rebates. Uh, a lot of our rebates are closed. We're out of money. This is one of the ones that we're still funding for 2018. So we provide $500. So uh, in general, to install a level two charger in somebody's garage on a separate circuit, we meter it separately. Uh, it's about a thousand to fourteen hundred dollars. So essentially, we pay for the labor to uh, install that unit uh, in the house. And like I said, you can you can buy in-home units for four hundred to you know eight hundred dollars, depending on how fancy you want to get, how many plugs they have. Yeah, and so Elk River, we have about twenty-four thousand residents. So to have ten charging stations in home is pretty good. Um, and I think. We can talk about it too more, but like having events where people can come out, see the city's electric vehicles and talk through it. Even in the last two years, I feel like we've seen more interest. People are more familiar with it. They know someone who has an EV or they know someone who's thought about it or something. So it's been really helpful and encouraging to see that those local events are not just people who already have an EV and want to talk to someone about it. I mean, we've experienced people that we're just at a farmer's market and have some connection and interest yeah, to we, it. Yeah, we had one on display and kind of like you had said earlier, once people drive them, uh, yeah. they really love them. So the you know the test drive events are are always great to host. Uh, the farmers market was more of an informational session and try and get um, people who don't drive them to come in and, and kick the tires and, and learn about them. Um, so a little bit more about our results from Fleet Karma um, at a city level. This was the information we really needed to show our city council that we could have an EV in our fleet. Um, and that it would work for us and that our city staff could drive it and do everything they needed to do in Elk River and beyond. Um, so that that fleet garment study, I don't know that we would have convinced them to add an EV to our fleet if we didn't have that information. So it was really critical for us. Um, we've talked about this, we've all talked about it, the vehicles have to be priced and size comparable. So all a lot of our staff say they need a truck, they need to be able to tow, needs to be a certain size. And, <clears throat> Yeah, the Volt was not appealing to really anybody. So we have, we leased um, the plug-in hybrid electric Outlander. So it's all wheel drive. It's a really nice vehicle. It fits for staff if we ever needed to go somewhere together, which is great. Um, and the range on that's about 30. And then you purchased um, the Chevy Bolt. Yeah, so it, it, it's kind of interesting. And, and part of the rationale was the city was <laughs> of the opinion that the technology in the EV market is changing so fast. Do we want to uh, purchase a vehicle with it making so many leaps and bounds so quickly? On the utility side, they said, well, we got two chargers. We're going to have three chargers. We want our customers to know that we're committed to the technology. So if we're going to do it, we're going to go all in and you're going to do uh, battery 100% electric with the uh, farthest range that we have that we can get. And that's why we selected uh, the Bolt. And uh, so far, it's been uh, working great. Little hiccup 
going to Alexandria. And the only reason I got in trouble in Alexandria is I Googled and they, I went on plug share, great network. Um, and they said they had a 240 volt charger. So, uh, drove up there, went to plug in and it was a 240 volt receptacle. I was like, boy, that's great, but I can't plug my charging cord into it. <laughs> so here again, uh, a lot of this goes back to, you know, did they, you know, it, it's there, they didn't, they just didn't know, you know, and that's part of that whole educational process and, and we'll get better at it, but uh, then I looked up online and I can buy a eWorks adapter and I could have used that, but I just didn't have the adapter. So they thought they were doing the right thing. They wanted it out there, but they just weren't quite sure uh, what they were um, posting and, and how it could affect people. So uh, it's a progressing uh, technology. And one of our very avid um, EV supporters in town, he has a Chevy Bolt. He, he always puts it to the analogy of when the internal combustion engine first came out. If you were driving a long distance, you put gas cans in the back because you couldn't find a fuel station. So even the internal combustion engine with all of its glory and all of its filling stations, you know, to date still had a very modest beginning and, and people had to work around. So uh, it's, it's kind of, it, it's been growing pains, I think, on the, on the infrastructure, but VW settlement and what uh, MPCA is doing with uh, the, the roadmap over the next few years of getting that infrastructure, I think we'll get there. Um, and then just kind of the last point, so we've been very fortunate to have our German partners kind of be leaders and also provide measurable goals. So we were talking about it even just this week that at a city level, it's great that we have this one lease electric vehicle, but we don't have specific goals within our city policy about how many electric vehicles we should have, what that schedule looks like, or even really recommendations about what we should be considering. So I think working with our German partners, seeing what they have planned for the future, and then also working with our other Minnesota cities as part of this has been really beneficial for us. I was just gonna say questions, yeah. so your timing is perfect. Is your research available? Well, first of all, is your research continuing? The fleet karma, like the tracking of the vehicles? Yeah. No. No, that was just a nine month period. Yeah, we signed a, a year long contract with them and we uh, made this decision to not forego or we didn't want to pay for it year to year afterwards. And then is the initial research available? Yeah. Okay, where would one get that? On both city websites, I think. Yeah, we've done. If they're specific, I can send it to you too. Yeah, it, it's buried. Yeah, so Fleet Karma like produces a final report at the end that's really detailed. Um, I don't know if that's online, but we have like high level presentations like what I gave to city council is available, but we can give you detailed information if you want that. Yes. Yeah, they measure the NOx and SOx and CO2. Oh, yeah, definitely. All of, I mean, within our program, uh, all the public chargers and all the in-home chargers, we designate renewable energy to all of those sites. It is uh, a huge focus uh, of the marketing in in-home. And one of the things, you know, there's a lot of challenges. What we really market is the, is the cost savings, you know, the total cost of ownership, cost per mile. I mean, our avid uh, Chevy Bolt driver, um, he keeps very diligent notes on how far he uh, drives uh, per kilowatt hour and his cost per mile is 0 0.009 cents uh, per mile. And that's factoring in operation and maintenance of his vehicle. Uh, we've been driving, uh, I've been driving that Chevy Bolt for um, since April, and it's uh, if I use uh, our public chargers with the connection fee, and we can talk about fee structure and all of that, it's about one and a half cents uh, per mile if we take off that connection fee. 
uh, it's about a penny a mile to, to drive the, the Chevy Bolt. So the more you drive them, the more you save, which is kind of the, the beauty of those vehicles. Yes? I have a question about the use of your fast charger. Do you track the usage? Yes. Uh, it, we, uh, here again, this gets into rate making, and this is part of what our grant was about, time of use rates, connection fees, and things like that. Uh, summary is when it was priced uh, better, it got used more. They are very, uh, EV owners are very savvy. All of the EV chargers, uh, like I had mentioned, plug share, that's a statewide app. There's also uh, charge point, they have their own network, but they can look up all the rates on their, on their phone and see. And uh, when we implemented connection fees uh, to try and recover some of our fixed costs for putting in that DC fast charger, uh, to connect to the DC fast charger, we charge $5 to connect. And we charge $2 to connect to a level two. When we put that $5 fee on their uh, use crater, and uh, the, D, uh, the level two, that's remained pretty constant at the, at the $2. And where you, you get into a problem with charging, P, uh, EV charger, EV owners like to plug in when they're at a place and plug for me, uh, charge for maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, which is great if you're not paying a connection fee. But if you're paying $5 to connect, you want to leave it there uh, for a longer time to maximize you know, your value. Uh, granted, you can get energy, you know, three to four times faster out of the DC fast charger than you can the level two, plus the expense, and you know, you can run those economics. But uh, hopefully, going forward, we're going to talk with the, our utilities commission and see if we can change the rates and move away from the connection fee for both of them and maybe uh, increase the, the energy rate because right now we charge. Uh, $5 connection fee, and then if you're in off-peak hours on the DC fast charger, it's $0.06. Cents. And if you're on on-peak hours, it's $0.13.5. And, uh, and looking at other uh, DC fast chargers, maybe moving to a, you know 18 to $0.22 cent straight up energy rate per kilowatt hour would be a better mix with the users and still uh, allow us to recover some of those additional costs. But here again, we're learning. Uh, as we're going, and uh, definitely connection fees are not great for the EV users. Oh, okay, now I understand. Do like a cost equivalent comparison on the, uh, on the uh, interface? That's a good thought, yeah. Yeah, because it's about uh, what you know. You, you get, um, I get three point uh, little for for round numbers. You know, four uh, four miles per kilowatt hour, depending upon if I have the heat or the air conditioning on. That will come down a little bit. So you know, if you're uh, filling up at, at six cents, you divide that by four. You're one point two, and if you're uh, paying the thirteen cents, you know, then you're a little bit higher. Uh, but the, the, the big thing, at least in the United States here, the big statistics are saying 80% 80, 80 of the charging is happening at home. So here again, we're back to that infrastructure in, in the public that has to be out there to build confidence for people to buy the vehicles and be able to take it uh, and go where they want. Uh, but majority of the charging is gonna be at home and then the customers, you know, 
majority of your kilowatt hours is going to be at six and a half cents. That's what our off peak is. You come home from work, plug it in, and, and you charge from 12 o'clock at night until four or five in the morning. And then it's ready for you to go in the morning. <coughs> Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Bartlick, and I'm the head of the Institute of Vehicle Powertrain System Technology at the University of South Australia. I said it before. And uh, we are supporting basically our vicinity by the cities of Iserlohn, the city of Rügenscheid, <laughs> and, and Ansgar, part of this entire uh, clean, uh, smart, uh, clean, smart, smart uh, municipalities. And uh, with regard to academic education, with regard to technical support, and maybe advice in certain kind of areas. And I would like to bring you a little bit closer to that kind of a little bit about uh, talk about transportation innovations. But of course, uh, would like to would like to uh, address uh, a few aspects status quo to pick you up at the bus station today. Where are we today, and where want we to go to? Looking into electric and hybrid vehicle powertrains, of course, with regard to the increasing electrification. Efficiency of energy production is one part which comes into the uh, picture because it's not yet there today. I'm also talking a little bit about the major obstacles and maybe potential solutions, how to create new view on battery powered uh, electric vehicles and uh, energy uh, supply for these vehicles. As I said, when, oops, when looking, when talking to my students, I always say, if you want to do something for the future, you have to think about the past. Learn lessons what took, take this, what have the lessons which have been learned. And of course, already in the early 19th, early 20th century, there has been electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, um, even a Ferdinand Porsche known for other vehicles has been involved into the, in the, first, in the first hybrid vehicle with nice, uh, nice technology in terms of uh, hub driven uh, electric motors and of course here in the US for example Woods Motor Vehicle Company in Ohio has made a hybrid vehicle in 1950. Battery electric vehicles were already available in Chicago 1905, more than 1000, largest community of electric vehicles at this time, but they were suffering from one part, is basically capacity. Electricity was available in cities, of course that was the reason, and it was the issue of getting further out of the city, which came to, uh, to uh, which led to the conclusion to have uh, electric power connected with internal combustion engine power in order to get a better range out of it. In the past, also, like we have seen, Fort Nuclear was once uh, one one of the kind of lighthouse projects in a certain way in the 50s, 80s, 60s, and later on, basically turbine cars. Uh, to look into certain kind of innovations to make available to the transport sector certain kind of innovations but of course there have been always reasons not to do that understandable if you just briefly look into the current situation the, uh, the vehicles you have in here you have about 100 percent of the power you put as chemical power into a vehicle in terms of fuel you add uh, you have losses to suffer and you only get about one eighth of the energy to the wheels. That's something which is forbidden to happen in a certain way. These are numbers, for example, for a family car, like in former times, I think data were for, for tourists. And for this reason, it is something we have to look into, well, making it better. Get back, don't have losses, don't lo look into the different kind of uh, resistances which have been, uh, have been part of the losses in a certain way. And of course, maybe to look what is possible with regard to other kind of energies, other kind of drive systems. And this is something which led to the issue of looking into future transportation, of course, with regard to battery, battery electric powertrains, coming back in, into the area. Oops, oh, quite my, my background picture 
is not there, and, and so some of the some of the text has has been has been deleted in a certain way. Uh, and we have basically different other kind of types of innovations, like for example, hybrid vehicles, where we have basically a serial type hybrid vehicles, which is here in this uh, in this part seen that you have uh, an engine at a certain point, a primer remover, and you have basically the, the no uh, connection to the uh, to the axles, no, no uh, connection to the wheels, but through a generator and battery system to drive an electric motor. This is one part of it. And it could be, for example, done as a kind of what we call today plug-in hybrid vehicle, where the internal combustion engine is just being a range extender, for example, in a certain way, and mainly drive in urban areas and where it's possible with regard to the range with electric power, but have a little bit eight in the, in the back in order to have an increased range. There are also full series hybrid drive systems, which are not so uh, advantageous because you have so much power. If you want to have 100 kilowatt of power for such kind of vehicle at the wheels, you need to have 100 kilowatt of power for the generator and you would have to have 100 kilowatt power for your internal combustion engine. This adds complication, this adds the weight, and all the advantage of a serial drive system is then not longer uh, uh, brought to the street. We have basically, on the other hand, fuel cell powered vehicles where, you're in, where you have basically the internal combustion engine replaced by a fuel cell system. Otherwise, you have an electric drive system because you produce through the uh, fuel cell electricity you can use for your propulsion system. The third part is the parallel hybrid vehicle and of course certain kind of smaller micro or mild hybrid where for example the electromotor is for example just used for power boost to have smoother operation with for example with internal combustion engine to have it more stable so that emissions are uh, minimized and the EM, the electric motor, takes all the kind of dynamics out of it. And you have, of course, distributed power drive systems as you have it, for example, with the uh, Toyota Prius. This is a typical way where you have basically a primary drive system, a secondary drive system, and they can be uh, completely uh, being uh, flexible with regard to being used solely electrical, solely ICE, or a mix out of both. And of course, there's always an issue of about conventional ICE vehicles if you look into alternative fuels. That's something where, for example, powertrain innovations from the engine side is one part of it. Variable valve timing, variable compression. All these issues are also true for the kind of ICEs you put into any kind of hybrid vehicle. But on the other hand, Alternative fuels, as you know them today, is of course basically natural gas, it's hydrogen, it's LPG, methanol, ethanol in the past, but more it's coming the innovation with regards to the chemical, from to the chemical industry to create uh, e-fuels, we call it, basically fuels which are generated basically through electric power, excess electric power, so that there is a different path Having, uh, having battery electric powertrain systems brought into place where it's possible. Otherwise, if not, you can use fuels which have been produced through uh, renewable resources. I will come to this a little bit later. The issue is, of course, oops, the issue is, of course, that the conversion efficiency for different vehicle fuels are different. If you have basically crude oil based gasoline, diesel, and uh, uh, you have a loss through the production of about 10 to 12 percent. If you take some fuels, synthetic diesels through natural gas, for example, you already lose about 40 percent of the entire energy. If you take coal, it's even more than that. If you take biomass, it's in the same range and even worse, depending on what kind of resource you, uh, you're using. And from a, a German perspective and European perspective, the electricity is not as a current status, not renewable. And for this, we have a certain kind of electricity EU mix, which means basically from the 100% you have, in a certain way, you will have only about 35% of efficiency. So you lose already from the power creation or power plant under the, to, the, to the wall plug, you lose already 65%, which is not a good 
a good idea. It will switch over time with increasing renewable uh, power generation in the different countries, but currently that's in the mix of the existing uh, infrastructure. But looking into what, for example, a company like Audi is looking into with regard to the pathway of transportation from the side of basically passenger cars, mainly not with regard to buses, is that coming from conventional power trains, where, oh, everything is messed up, <laughs> with regard to the graphics, um, uh, we are looking into uh, bringing in place alternative fuels, hybrid vehicles, and of course, e traction at a certain point, with the goal to reduce the carbon footprint in CO2 per kilometer from about 120 grams in 2015 down to 20 grams in 2050, which is about a 83% uh, reduction of CO2 emissions. It's a long way to go and a lot of technology uh, aspects to be looked at, especially some of the fuels. We call it sun fuels, a kind of biofuels in a certain way, uh, mild hybrids and uh, plug-in hybrids, and the kind of, kind of battery-driven uh, electric vehicles. So this is from the industry view on what they presume to, uh, presume to uh, be conducted in order to reach the goal, which has been set to about 20 gram at 2050. Well, with all the intermediate steps, we have seen, and, and uh, Ulrike has mentioned already, 95 grams in 2020 as a fleet average. The obstacle we have on one hand is, of course, any kind of battery we add. We add weight to the, to the vehicle, and we add uh, the requirement to have power to recharging of batteries. And depends, of course, with the size of the vehicle, with the larger size of the vehicle, of course, you need basically the energy for 500 uh, kilometers vehicle range is increasing, the battery weight is increasing. So these are the obstacles and the kind of research which has been done and need to be done, research and development in order to improve the situation of charging capacity and versus weight. This is the key effort with regard to the uh, electric vehicle and hybrid vehicle electrification pathway. Did you come with my fingers? <laughs> you're not, not, not uh, using. You're not using. It's PowerPoint. Uh, uh, but completely messed up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, of course I will go through. Not talking about that. So. Um, all with regard to this, because in, uh, I did, uh, I, t I took my German, my, uh, some of my German slides and put in, uh, put in uh, English titles and English, uh, uh, English uh, side, uh, side comments, and <laughs> it's not, not it's not so clear. Okay, we will see. If you look vehicle size and you look at the vehicle daily range, what is today available with a certain variety of vehicles, of course, with regard to small to medium vehicles and the kind of urban and commuting up to 60 kilometers per day is easily being possible with today's technology. It's increasing in a certain way. With plug-in hybrids, we have basically the, uh, uh, the possibility to extend to larger size and to larger uh, driving range. And on the other hand, with regard to the larger vehicles or heavier vehicles and the escape, what we call the escape, uh, mode to have a, a higher daily driving range. It's difficult to uh, set this up today with today's technology with not having any disadvantages. And one disadvantage, of course, is cost and weight in this case. So when looking into the uh, major obstacles we have with uh, today in our infrastructure, to look into sustainable, renewable electrical power generation to have basically CO2 free generation of power. We have the, of course, the, the effect or the, the obstacle, the hurdle of the main, uh, last mile infrastructure. Of course, in Germany you have it because uh, if you have, uh, would have to connect maybe a multi-tenant house with uh, with electrical power for vehicles, 
you have to take care what kind of capacity of electrical power do you have in the street lines underground. And this is a limiting factor up to a certain extent. And of course, the charging stations, accumulator charging stations in the public area needs to be, the uh, number needs to be increased. Vehicle range, battery capacity versus vehicle weight is a key issue of the next five to 10 years in order to overcome this. Uh, I think that's uh, basically coming together with the issue of the vehicle cost, because what costs today is battery and power electronics. It's copper and accumulator uh, price. And for this reason, today, for example, battery costs are about, two, in Germany or in Europe, about 200 to 250 uh, euro per kilowatt hour of your capacity. And Last week we had the, the uh, truck IIA, the fair truck fair uh, in, in international truck fair in Germany, and Daimler uh, told us that they are looking into uh, a price reduction to about 150 uh, euro per kilowatt hour uh, until 2025. So it's a significant decrease, but it also takes still some time. And of course, it is clear that the market segments will answer or have to answer or will we'll put different questions to, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, manufacturers of vehicles, whether they are passenger car or light duty vehicle manufacturers or whether they are commercial vehicle <laughs> manufacturers. Because if you power a bus or a truck, it's a difference if it is running in the, uh, in the city or whether it's a long haul truck need for capacity for, for long haul uh, transport. And, and for this reason, there will be, will be a different, or a certain number of different solutions from manufacturers because of the different requirements within the segment. When looking into. Again, it's the uh, font color is white. That's the problem. Okay. Oh, okay. We, can, we can change it on the slides. <laughs> no, no, this is yeah. it's okay. Uh, well, now, now it's an issue, for example, if you look into renewable generation of electricity <coughs> and in, uh, you look into basically photovoltaics, you look into wind energy, for example, you have, of course, certain kind of boundary conditions. In Germany, we are a country, I've learned yesterday from the discussions, uh, the west of Germany is as large as Minnesota, uh, except we have living there about 60 million people, overall in Germany about 80 82 million people. So compared to the surface area of the stray state or the country, uh, we are having a heavily populated area. And for this reason, for example, putting in wind turbine, wind turbines is a little bit more challenging. For this reason, we are looking into offshore, that's basically into the northern sea area. And on the other hand, we have a lot of onshore mm -hmm. systems, but as you see, the full load operation hours are, of course, on the seaside, much higher than onshore because the wind is much more intense and much more uh, intense uh, operating hours. So the development right now is basically to get more into or more and higher powered wind turbines in the offshore section up to eight to nine uh, megawatt units. And uh, at the, at the uh, onshore level, you have been limited with regard to the full load operation hours. And this is because the wind is a matter of the strength of the wind is a matter of the height. So in the onshore, you see that the uh, wind turbines become higher, larger. So they count about, I think something like uh, half a percent or up to a percent improvement of power catching the wind or wind catching power basically on onshore, uh, which means basically per, per meter of height of the wind turbine. And the largest wind turbine in Germany, I just, uh, just looked it up uh, this morning again, is sitting close to Stuttgart in the south of Germany. And it's already at about 175 meters of height for the hub of the wind turbine. At about three and a half megawatt 
uh, for the three and a half megawatt unit, and an overall height of about 245 to 250. So in order to have an improved efficiency of, and um, means basically higher wind full load operation, you need to build them higher, which is a critical path with regard to neighborhoods with regard to uh, heavily uh, populated areas. This is currently so, uh, a little bit the discussions we have over in Germany to what extent we can, we can uh, improve situation uh, in this case, because most of the uh, onshore uh, wind turbines are in the range of one to two megawatt, even the older ones smaller than that, but also again, uh, not with the same height as uh, the modern ones. What do we do with it? And this is the other issue, is basically uh, we see from, from uh, some of the from some of the operational uh, uh, tracking of this entire concept is basically that we have excess power in certain ways available. And we have the possibility to use asset, uh, excess power. And uh, assumptions and, and uh, a forecast has been made, for example, for 2050, to look into the availability of renewable energy, electricity in Germany. So over a year period from January through December, you have certain kind of deficit, the red sign, or you have excess, which means you have extra power available. It's not constant. That's a, that's a bad situation of using wind. And this is not only wind, also solar energy. The bad situation about this, it's not just a pipeline where you put one, uh, one thing in the one end and you get it out on the other end. You have to be aware that you have these phases where you have it available. It might be phases where you don't have it available. So current industry actions and industry work as consideration of storage where you have access in, overcome, in order to overcome the deficit time periods <coughs> to a certain extent. And of course, on the other hand, to look into the electricity we have to have something we call power to gas concept. So to store the extra energy, not like, for example, underground or in a kind of accumulators in a certain way, large accumulators, that's one possibility, but to store it in something else, for example, hydrogen or synthesis gas in order to, with, with regard to looking into electrolysis in order to use it for electrolysis to uh, create hydrogen or synthesis gas and put it in a cycle, for example, with biomass cycle in order to feed in methane gas to have store the energy in somewhat which is better storable, either in a, in a gaseous form or in a liquid form. So we have the power to gas concept and maybe the next step is power to liquid. And this means basically that with regards to the technology and the, uh, the innovation in transportation, we have to look into the battery electric power aspects and also to look into aspects where the conventional or more conventional uh, technology streets still including certain amount of power through internal combustion engines could be taken into account also to use renewable, such called e-fuels. A lot of research program and one research program has last week, last week being, uh, been awarded to the Technical University of Aachen in order to look further into this, uh, into this uh, area. And my, for, my former institute in Aachen has been divided into two sections. One is for engine technology or powertrain propulsion technology. On the other part of the institute has been named new for new fuels, for e-fuels. So it's a major aspect in the near future to look into, what is it? Energy supply security in different pathways in order to keep our possibility to, to, to secure individual mobility on a, on a very high level. And this is basically the current situation with regard to innovation processes over from the German side or European side. And of course, that's always a motto <laughs> with regard to that, with JFK, don't ask what the environment, your environment can do for you. 
but better ask what you can do for the environment. Because all of that process is nice, but it takes people. Only people can implement something. Process can only guide people to implement something. And with this, I would like to close. <laughs> Thank you. There are certain there are certain kind of aspects looking into it, even with regard to power generation, uh, with a, a whole household energy and so on, in order to uh, to to have concepts for uh, for individual storage in uh, in, in households. Feed it back into the grid. It is, uh, uh, with regard to batteries, uh, the, the, the aspect is, uh, for example, that, that it's uh, being planned, for example, battery electric vehicles, uh, battery packs from, from these vehicles to use uh, used ones still for having certain kind of power, add them into a kind of well, power, power unit cloud in order to have uh, more capacity than for the, uh, for the electrical grid. So older batteries will be put together into, uh, in order to create a, a larger accumulation system. That's one point. The other issue is with regard to feeding it back into the grid from your home location is it of course an act, a factor that when you're charging your battery from the wall plug to your battery pack, you lose about 50% of power. That's the charging losses. 50% of power. Now we have a BMW i3 at the university and with an 18.8 uh, ampere hours uh, capacity of the battery, when we are fully down and we recharge it, we have to pay for 21.8 kilowatt hours. So with this, it's 15%, uh, it's 15% loss. I was surprised about that as well. But this, these are the issues which are, which are being uh, or need to be addressed with regard to this, is the faster you charge, uh, heat, the higher, the higher, the higher the, the, the losses are. So it's an, it's an aspect, if you use it for your vehicles, fine. If you want to feed it back, you have again losses. Well, it's, an, it's, it's a calculation, a calculation uh, uh, item on one hand and a coordination item yeah. with regard to where does the system know and what battery pack in what kind of vehicle at what kind of home location we have uh, electricity available which can be used maybe in the same house for uh, the the uh, uh, air conditioning system for example yeah. intelligence of the house <laughs> my house is not intelligent <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but but it may in the future, I don't know, but these are the aspects uh, where, where communities are working on, so research communities are working on, uh, looking into this aspect, to what extent, at what kind of time, this will be efficient to be implemented in, in a smart home environment. I'm the wrong guy, I'm working with, 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 with wheels. <laughs> uh, 
um, is there anybody else? Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Last time I talked to you, we talked about uh, charging stations uh, being uh, set up at Capitol Complex. 52 additional, there's a total of 69, and they said, Larry, what are you thinking of? That's going to be five, six, maybe even seven years before we're going to use those 69 charging stations. Today, we have seven ramps. Three ramps are at capacity, and I'm demonstrating them how they can share to charge their vehicles by parking near a charging station. Uh, the other four are nearing capacity and will be at capacity in this next year. So this is a real thing. This is happening and it's time now to join on. I was just at a breakfast and we had um, Mary Nichols who is the chairperson for the Air Resources Board for California. She's actually done the job twice. She's done so well. She did the job back in the 70s and now it's been asked to come back. Uh, they had, oh, they're had they now on their way to 1 million EVs in California. Uh, they, are, they are benchmarking against China for a state. Right now their sales are about five, just now got to 5% of total sales in California are electric vehicles. Um, so things are happening there and moving along. Just for us here in Minnesota, I think we're at less than 1% and we're at about 6,300 vehicles here in Minnesota today. So I wanted to give you an update, and I know we're behind the schedule a little bit. Yeah. I'm okay? Okay. Uh, my last update, we went through this, we talked about the executive order, we talked about some cars, we talked about uh, what the state's goals were and, and what the next steps were. I'm gonna focus today on those next steps. So I got that actual slide that I briefed you. Here's my next step slide that I left you with last time. Uh, we talked about things like the fleet action plan, developing a way to track vehicles and how, how would you actually model your fleet so that you can go forward through the sustainability reporting tool. We discussed a little bit about the VW and what we're doing there. And then we talked about seeking reduced evening rates for, from utilities. And number five, there's rebates from utilities. So I'll talk a little bit about that also with the pilot that we're working on right now. So the fleet action plan, a little hard to see there, but if the slides are sent out, this action, uh, link does work. Here's the fleet action plan. It's uh, 15 pages long, so not a, not a hard read. You can pick that up, and it's uh, now available as of last night on our website. So uh, if you go there, you'll pick that up, and just as a shameless plug, today sometime the annual report will actually be posted on the website also, right next to the fleet action plan. So you'll be able to see the annual report and what's going on with any state of Minnesota. Um, a little bit about this, if I were to summarize the fleet action plan, here it is right here. It's pretty easy, this is what we're asking our state agencies to do. We're saying go out and track your vehicles and your fuel use, believe it or not, not all agencies were doing that. Now they are. Those things are done. Go out and right size your fleet. Work with your employees on their driving habits. We have a certain part of the population likes to drive fast and likes to brake hard. Mm -hmm. And idle, as Elk River knows, idling is something also state, uh, public employees like to do a lot of. So uh, be able to track your, what's going on and, and to work on those behaviors to change them for the better. Um, incorporate electric vehicles and biofuels. And we have a lot of E85s in the state fleet. So if you have an E85 vehicle, put E85 in it. Um, and then lastly, the work there, sort of a, just as we're going towards 2027 is to work on the alternate fuels. We got some plans. We'd like to integrate renewable diesel into the economy here. And we'd also like to work towards um, a hydrogen fuel cell example going forward. So that's sort of where we, we see going overall. Where are we today? So I told you last time I was here, it was, a, it was an absolute reduction of 30% was what we're gonna do at the state of Minnesota. We're gonna do that from 2017 to 2027. We are 13% towards that goal, or in real terms, it's three, almost 4% reduction. 
that we've had in our fuel use. How have you done that? Mostly it's through to date, it's mostly through buying. And I would say of the levers that you see in the fleet action plan, the one that I would implement first is to buy the EPA set a score of seven or higher, okay? What does that mean for you for buying? That means it can be a regular ICE hybrid vehicle, like the was talked about earlier here. Um, it could be a very, very efficient internal combustion engine that's very efficient uh, the way it's set up. Or it's going to be a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle or an electric vehicle. Those are what you're going to see in the EPA 7 or higher. And by doing that, you can get EPA um, scores from the EPA website itself for all your vehicles, for all the vehicles that you're looking at buying. And that, that alone has probably had the best, the most result of any area. The only area that I haven't been able to penetrate yet is the law enforcement vehicles. And we're gonna to try to focus on, on those next because they're all our alternatives now available for the law enforcement folks also. Um, just to give you a little bit, uh, our target is 12, a little over 12 million gallons. Currently today, our um, just baseline numbers, we're at 17.7 is where we're at right now for, for burning fossil fuels. Um, second, second item that I talked about on way ahead was the sustainability reporting tool. This tool is being produced by us. We actually got a grant from the McKnight Foundation. We had to match that grant and then we had to add some more money to it to get what we wanted. Um, the fleet planning function is now being tested. That's one of the, there's a huge playing part of in the sustainability reporting tool um, that we have. And the fleet part is probably, probably has the most bells and whistles of any of the areas. So for that loan, it would be uh, beneficial for, for local government use. Uh, it will be available uh, for local governments in late 2019. Um, again, we're working with Fig Bites, which is a, which is a California company. Uh, for, for local governments, there may be a slight fee for modifications or something that needs to be done for your use. But it's, the sustainability reporting tool is not for fleet only. We also can do solid waste procurement. We can do water and take your information from B3 for water and energy. And also, it does calculate your greenhouse gas, which is a fun thing because you get it right now, right today, and when you put in the gallons, it actually tells you what your output is, which is a lot more important than getting a report uh, six months into the next year about what you did last year. There's really not a lot you can do with that. Uh, having an immediate impact by showing what you're actually doing today is probably a little bit more important. Uh, build out of infrastructure. Uh, we did have a request in. Uh, VW Electrify America. You might have heard the Flintstones commercials. Has anybody heard the Flintstones commercial? Got somebody in the back. So it has a guy coming up to the stoplight. He's there. He's got Save the Planet or Love the Planet on his sticker on his back. And then the Chevy Bolt comes up next to him. You know, he's smoking there at the thing and the Chevy Bolt takes off from the light and leaves him in the dust because it's got good power transfer and it has great acceleration going forward uh, and it plays the Flintstone song in the commercial itself. Uh, 45 million is going into from this uh, America funding. Uh, if you go to plug into the present.com there's 45 million going into that um, effort to tell people that if you're still driving a nice vehicle you're in the stone age you need to move forward and get, get with it. Uh, we do have a request then from M2M is Michigan to Montana. That's focusing on the I-94 corridor that's right through here. And the intent would be to help you out so you don't get stranded. We have plans to go have, there is a charger in Monticello at the Goodwill, fast DC fast charger. There will be one soon, probably in Sox Center and also in Alexandria on the corridor here. Uh, we're working on this funding one way or another. We're gonna get this done even if we don't get the funding from the M2M uh, project. That's the Department of Energy grant. And then we're working with an Excel. Probably this is the most exciting thing for local governments because this, if this pilot goes through and is successful, this pilot will be replicated for all state and local government. We're looking at a charging infrastructure project, which you can get into infrastructure for very low cost. 
uh, everything from the transformer up to the actual charging element itself. And then you can make a decision whether you want to buy it or do you want to, I guess it'd be lease it or whatever from Excel and pay a small amount on your bill each, each uh, period. So those are the options we're looking at. That's 100% renewable. The focus is on using that excess energy that's available at night so that we can bring down costs for all Excel customers because now we're using that energy that before was either we had to, Excel had to pay for to get rid of it or they had to stop the renewable energy production at night, one of the two. So uh, the focus there for fleet charging is from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning is where we're looking at. What is the timeline for the local government to know when okay. results are coming? We are, they were supposed to have got their um, into the PUC here at the end of September. I think it's going to be very soon though. I'm working on letters of support for them right now. And I suspect that um, they lose submission here within, in, within October is when it will happen. So if you want to follow it, you can go to the PUC website and be able to follow the action as it goes along with that. I think this is a slam dunk, I believe because of the fact that PUC basically told Excel they needed to do something like this. So we've been working with Excel for almost a year to try to get them to move towards this. And then I just think in February and March, they came back to us and said, okay, we need to do something together. So this, we, I don't because they haven't submitted it. I don't think they've submitted it yet. So I don't have it, but I'll make it available once, it, once we have it. Uh, the intent then would be cascade this for all fleets, both commercial fleets and public, uh, public, public and private. Okay, I didn't know all this information when I was here last time, so I brought some information for you. Um, right now in our state fleet, we have uh, it's a number of vehicles, 11,622 plus, because we haven't accounted for all the off-road vehicles, and we have one agency that has not fully reported. Um, but the EPA, EPA score seven or higher, the 605. So that's where a lot of that 4% reduction came from. Um, 62 right now, and that's old. So I, I think it's closer to 70 today, but officially it's 62 today. But there's, yes. there. so the EPA score of seven, this is an EPA standard like tool, is a standard? Standard, yep. So where would you find it? So if a local government wants to set as a criteria, I know it can be found in a couple different places, but the EPA website is one, and I can I can look it up. There's another place through the NAPA uh, voting that uh, the National Automobile Whatever yeah, yeah. Association. Um, there's a couple different places that you can pick it up. What we've done is we we've branded this score of seven higher. We put the green Minnesota on it. We say that's a green choice, and we're redu we're reducing the number of other choices that they have that are not green when you go to go to work with your different offices and so forth within your governments itself. So this is the way that we're, we're getting people to move towards the right choices. But it's an efficiency score in terms of- It talks about, it really goes back to miles per gallon or miles per gallon equivalents. Okay. They're calculated and um, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but I know that this is sort of the, it, it's where you want to be. Okay, all right. so, I mean, it's a simple- it's a simple the energy number. star score of Sort of, yes. Sort of. And it's not on the sticker when you go to buy a vehicle? It, it's not. not. Yeah. Not that, I, not that I know of. I've never seen it on any sticker. But we branded it, so we, when we give out our uh, buying guide, which we've given before here, we actually put the green Minnesotas on it so that they can then look in their mind and say, okay, that's a good choice. That's yeah, the one I should next year. Um, we have 70, we have more than this today, but there's 77. Through that pilot, we're looking at another 200 and up to 250 ports that would be added to that. So that's going to significantly increase that number of stations. Um, we talked about gallons, we talked about that. This one surprised me. So we put in those stations, the 69 we talked about. And I knew this was going to happen. I, I predicted that it would happen, but we have 22 people now that are state employees that are actually have EVs and that are plugging in. And that demand is, um, they're getting about three or four additional people per month. That's what they've been picking up recently. They get a fob, we track their consumption and so forth. No, we're not charging them yet because they're still studying it. 
from the facility side, but at some point I think there will be an extra charge that would be put on. If you get a FOB, you pay so much per month, probably for the energy that you're using. And, oh, I knew people would ask me about state contracting. I checked on it. It's supposed to be November 1st. It's supposed to be the day. They said maybe in the last two weeks in October, but November 1st for sure. We should have a new buying guide. It's my hope to have at least one or two new vehicles on there beyond the vehicles we've had in the past. Larry, can you just do a quick overview of the state contracting options? Okay. Yes. Limits that we're not your last one. You can use, you can do a straight out buy based on the cost that's provided, or you can actually enter into a lease from our fleet services and lease it for a period. Our leases are normally for a five year period. Our leases are pretty much the whole lease is in there. I think the only thing is your fuel charge. It's the only thing you have to take care of yourself. Otherwise, everything else is included with the lease. So both of those things are available. It's available to any CPV member. So if your local government is a CPV member, which most of you are, because you're buying other things, um, you can buy vehicles also. And uh, it's a pretty good deal, uh, either leasing or buying. We got the, when we got the Chevy Bolts, we got them at the same price that New York and California got the vehicles for. So it was a good deal. Oh, <coughs> for semi, so you can see there in the orange is the light vehicle. So that's, there's a lot of potential there. Right now, there's really no, we're saying for most of our agencies, there's no reason why, if you're in the metro area, that you shouldn't have electric vehicle of some type. Um, we, we're working with people that are in greater Minnesota to try to set up them for success overall. Um, but the largest consuming vehicles are still our medium and heavy vehicles. So we need to find a diesel option. That's where the renewable diesel will be important going forward. There's contact information and with that, questions? Questions? I just want to comment, we bought, when we bought our Chevy Bolt, we bought it through the state bid of the pre-dainies and process. They did a nice job with the Ranger. Ranger? Yep. And, uh, it, it was uh, pretty seamless. The only thing that's a little down is we got a <laughs> the other questions? Yes. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yes. You're know, looking at the numbers there. Um, yeah, the, those numbers there. It looks like they're at five percent um, of the um, EPA or some uh, higher in the system right now, and. You know, what do you think is going to be the rate of adoption? You mentioned the, the speed with which the employees are moving to electric vehicle. That is, uh, you know, two or three a month. Mm -hmm. What, you know, in your wildest, I'm sure you have thought about this, you know, what would be the projection? How, how, how steep do you think is going to be the curve with which uh, the light vehicle slice of the pie chart is going to be? Turn into a plug-in EV or an EV. We, we want to double each year for the next three years, and then our intent is to get to as quickly as possible to 1,562 vehicles. And after that, in our plan, it actually shows. I forget what percentage per year it is there, but we think we can double the numbers for the next three years per year. Does that follow your? sort of planned fleet schedule or is it an accelerated schedule or how do you figure that in the plans that we're already there? Well, I was looking at what other states and looking to, I spent two nights, two dinners with the sustainability officer from New California. And just based on what he did and, and the sort of the path that he took and the help from Excel, I think it's gonna make a big difference. And my intent is not to stop with Excel my next stop will be with Minnesota Power. Yeah. And then my next stop after that will be Otter Tail Power and then we'll work on the rest of the folks after that. But um, we'd like something similar to be adopted. I think that's gonna get us to the point where, you know, it's less than 1% of the buy statewide to get us to that 5%. And that's, I think their success. So I'm sort of following their same trajectory that they're going on. And I feel that the state there, there's just no reason why you shouldn't have an electric vehicle if you're based here. The only thing complaint I get is getting the 
these same fast chargers out on the, so that they can go from their headquarters to the regional offices and back without being stranded. So I'm working that simultaneously right now with um, grant requests and if I have to, they'll go to the legislature if we have to do that. And that will help all the local governments too because they'll be available. Yeah. They might be on state land, like uh, a state rest stop, but you'll be able to use them. Right. Yeah. So real quick, you made me think of, so you're also running Solar Possible, which is solar on rooftop. With our yeah, good friends with, right back here, uh, yes. Solar on rooftop or ground mounted systems for public facilities. And I think, I think that you plan also to do Minnesota Power and Otter Tail. Is there opportunity to do solar and EV together? We're actually in a pilot with NREL, uh -huh. the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, to do just that. It's been slow going so far, but mm -hmm. the intent is to try to work the issues as it relates to integrating solar and EVs together. So it could be combined in the future. Yep. Also, cities and school districts. I think you know we'd be willing to partner with just about anybody, but I think using the utility company as the conduit is probably the best way to get there because they have the wherewithal, they have the knowledge, they have the only thing they don't know is you know they keep coming to me and asking me about install prices and so forth because we've actually done more installs than Excel has done. So, um, so I think that that type of partnership will work though, where we could have those same types of. Uh, uh, installations, you know, at, at Walmarts or, or wherever it might be through the commercial side of it. I think at some point the the car dealerships will actually, or not the car dealership, but the, the station convenience stores will pick this up. I mean, the, the, once you get to about 15 to 20 percent market share, then it's just going to take off. But it's just getting us to that 15 to 20 that I'm working on right now. You know, I'm thinking the city of, uh, city of Pop, Pine City did place a, a level two charger, I think within a block of a coffee shop. And I don't know, I'm not sure whether the coffee shop was there first or the charger was there first, but um, certainly people in the city talk about charge up and walk across the street to the coffee shop, which, yeah, charger -oriented convenient. Yeah, charger oriented. Yeah. For lunch, and yes, okay. You know, for, for us in Elk River location and where we cited them, that was a big driver. For level two, we cited downtown, uh, historic downtown, easy walk to 
some shopping uh, and lunch and dinner and other activities, and then DC fast charger on 169. Uh, proximity to a lot of traffic, uh, seven days out of the week, but primarily you know, Thursdays and Fridays, Sundays, and the grocery store. And that was uh, when we put that in, that is with the convenience. Well, not necessarily a convenience store, but it's a fuel station that was installed at the same time. And we had another uh, agreement to put it in a fuel station on Megway 10, but there was some logistic issues with road reconstruction, right? With way and a whole bunch of other little challenges with that. So that one kind of got um, pushed to the open site. Hopefully, that's where the next one will go when we're able to install another DC fast charger. But uh, yeah, you definitely have to uh, think about location, 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 what's available, people charging. Because they are going to be there anywhere from 10 minutes with the DC fast charger to you know probably an hour, hour and a half before. Good question. Yeah, someone online asked, is the Excel pilot program available to non-Excel customers? No. <laughs> it won't be until the pilot is either approved or it um, there's greater adoption of the same. So we have to get through and we prove that it's the right thing to do for Minnesota. And then once we do that, then yes, it should just open up the rest of the fleets and then commercial business, businesses and I think uh, local governments would also be able to do it at that time, especially with their fleets. Question? Uh, uh, you yes. see them? Okay. Yeah. So if you look at PlugShare, which you mentioned earlier, it maps out where where charges are, and oftentimes they are in Excel. Um, yeah. I mean, Larry mentioned Goodwill. They're a good yep. corporate uh, partner. You also have and uh, some ID. Yep. Is another big supporter of uh, charging stations along with Target. I know their target is popping up with more and more construction too. So those, you know, those are driven from their internal. I know in other states, Walmarts are also a place that you can go to. Some states almost have every Walmart has a charging station. Quick Trip is another one. <laughs> Some early adopters. Any other questions? Quick Trip Do you think you have some things that are listed on the charging number? Oh, ouch. Question right here. I'm wondering if any of the above the same name have been as a plan to enact in any way? What the compensation can be like for charges and taxes and interest? I don't know if you have any idea. I think it actually came up in our discussion that we had uh, with our German friends here. Okay. And we were looking at. Um, you know, potential ordinance change that would require um, major renovations and new construction to have a certain percentage of charging stations available at multi-family housing units and other areas to be able to help work on that. We think too, if I think the value of the vehicles, we, we feel that at the end of the five years through our leases, that they have about 35% value. I think they'll actually have more value than that, but that this would be an excellent opportunity for someone that's in that type of situation because of the low maintenance and so forth that's associated with an electric vehicle. This might be a good option for them. And they would still have five years of the warranty for most manufacturers still available with lower maintenance costs overall. So. I think that would be good as the start turning over to be available. That's okay. I was thinking um, and it would be less obvious in the discussion about fees, but like to have an opportunity to dress up after an obvious one. Um, I think just to have an electric vehicle, even if it's a right now, you need to be able to buy the new one. Correct. correct. Um, and it can be short-sighted doing that infrastructure 
the material now um, for new vehicle purposes when 20 years down the line entered uh, the renewable agency and potentially then help those municipal use more so by the way that they can because they have to be vehicle. But, but I think these vehicles will be excellent used vehicles because of the the warranty on the batteries are Can so long. Ten? Ten years is norm, normal. Ten yep. Years? yep. With the Chevy Bolt and I think, I think with Tesla too. I know it's five years on everything on Tesla, but I thought the battery was ten. Yeah. What did you say was that? Uh, we were looking at for the climate smart yeah. municipalities. Yeah. Is it? We were just talking about it in our planning management for a so not necessarily requiring charging stations, but just the conduit and the connection. The make ready like, portion. And I listened to a webinar and I forget what it was called, but it was like ready and this idea that like if you had even just like a parking lot in construction, it requires like a conduit penalty. And then maybe later on, and we were just talking to that maybe the new home requiring at least a two story in your garage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if like there's building codes in the United States too, but mm -hmm. at least to start talking about it. And maybe we would have rebates or incentives from like a community use. Why did you do that in the long run? Because it's more time and safety. How does that work? We make the landlord through the ordinance, made through the make ready, basically put in the installation and so forth to have be able to put those in. A certain percentage. Percentage. And then you have to buy your house by the You, you would probably get some kind of a fob from the landlord, and then you get in probably an extra fee, but uh, energy fee, I guess, for that fob itself. I think, I think maybe the key question is, does the state of Minnesota building code allow a city to put in an ordinance that there shall be a conduit to the parking lot or a uh, rental bulb by family uh, chargers? And I think the answer is, a city can pass an ordinance. Yes, is that Amanda? Is that your term? I have an understanding. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about it down at the Public Utilities Commission a couple months ago. They had a big work session, and that was part of that takeaway uh, uh, on a larger scale. Was the commission excellent. Excellent. Um, so sorry, I want to take the last ten minutes and bring it back to the yep. climate smart conversation. So I'm going to cut the questions off now. Sorry. Larry is available for additional questions, and thank you for your presentation. Um, so the Climate Smart Municipality Program, well, uh, <laughs> is really about, I know, I've, I've done that twice now. Um, you think I'd learn. Um, it's really about kind of sharing ideas, and I want to hear from Dylan and, and Elk River about, you know, what really uh, the last three years of your relationship, what kind of has stood out as as the drivers of the program and what where is it where is it pushing to do a little bit more? Um, so you talked a little bit about goal setting, but if you want to expand on that, I don't know who wants to take it first. But um, and, and Kristen, you know, you were involved early on. If you have any thoughts, you can ask her. Yeah. Um, so what what ha, where has um, what has this partnership? Pushed you to do more in your city. I don't know if we have, if we did more, but um, it is always interesting to hear what other cities like and what Google is doing. And in the end, we are both on the same step and go on because this theme is very new for all cities. And uh, now we try to go on together and talk to each other and uh, and how we experience uh, we um, learn from our experience. What we do. Yeah. Well maybe one can, can say from uh, my observation of all the, the different city peers and the whole planet's municipalities who has work together. It's really hard for a city, regardless of the size you are, to do something like it first. So it's, it's you know, electrification is really a new topic in Germany and also here. The, the number of EMPs in, in, in Germany is definitely very low. It's really extremely low. 
but that is changing rapidly for the cities to together to have the opportunity to exchange notes and what the plans are, what, the, what we need to do in order to meet climate goals and what the <coughs> now plan for is um, a big transformation of uh, personal of cars that we know possibly happen not too far out. Yeah. Um, it really helps to change notes. And the, the, the comforting aspect of all of this is that all of the cities are so different. So one understands that there are individualized solutions, but they need to work with your data. Like who here in Minnesota, you have an advantage over the German cities and the cities because you have the data system and that office that helps you actually, uh, um, that provides you like the same playing field to some degree with electric vehicles. So now we're really able to um, share ideas on how to improve the uptake of that particular technology. So it's, it's really going well. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Are there any other questions that folks have from other cities or anybody else about the program, maybe how you can involve, how you can stay in touch? There is 
geography matter, and the sense of size matter. The United States is huge, and Minnesota, Minnesota is a huge state with one tenth. It has the size of Germany with one tenth of uh, the population. So in Minnesota, we have a lot of uh, ground to cover with infrastructure. Um, okay. Well, Philip, do you want to plug our next workshop? I think we're. Oh yes. Uh, let me. I'm trying to help here. Yeah. Yeah. He's like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. I'm, I'm, I'm drifting across. It's like it's like well, aren't all the trains in in Europe electrified? Uh, no. Can I say one more thing about yes. this about electrified or not? Um, and you said that your community is powered. Yes, 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 definitely. And that is a green step action uh, for cities to promote the fact that uh, businesses and residents uh, for all public private cooperative uh, utilities, uh, an electric um, option for buying your electricity uh, is, is there and it does generate new uh, wind turbines and solar panels. So it's not just And it's not just Excel. So there's a, I think we have a link to on the certain side, probably all the uh, utilities, public, private, cooperative, that um, uh, and that particular type of program and how you sign up for it. So it's, it's true, we can all sign up, and it's a trivial, you know, a couple dollars more, maybe. Yeah, sometimes you get a credit in your bill because of. Uh, and if you are a city in Excel territory, Excel does produce community energy reports, and they'll tell you how many residents and businesses residents. are signed up for wind source, renewable connect, solar installations. Um, and participating in energy efficiency programs as well. So you can track that and you can um, uh, promote and, and Right, and maybe in our green step four or five metrics, I think. Yes. Yes, that's a, I think that's a reporting thing. So, so, anyway, November, so, so next, okay, so next so next workshop. So in the middle of uh, in the middle of October, uh, Minnesota is hosting Minneapolis is hosting a two day uh, eco district uh, conference. So this is put on by a nonprofit organization based out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, this two-day conference, um, we have uh, five or six at least Green Step City representatives who are going to this conference. They will come back and talk about what they learned uh, at our November workshop here at LMC, uh, first Wednesday, um, always in November. So we'll hear about uh, more deal detail about projects in the work, such as uh, the Ford site, the conversion of the old auto site into a um, uh, sort of mixed use development there. We'll hear about prospective uh, developments uh, out in Arden Hills. Um, so it'll be a very I interesting to also just ask that sort of asset, sort of question, uh, that sort of asset test for city people, which is eco districts. Wow, that sounds kind of like far out. Is that something that we really do this, you know, as our city council behind basically really high performing uh, small area plan? neighborhood. So that will be our next uh, next workshop. November. 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 First Wednesday in November. Nine to eleven. Yeah. LMC. Um I want to thank Jenna for doing all the technology and stuff. Pretty pretty nearly flawless, which usually the first workshop is not. So yes. Here's Jenna. The workshop and then the formatting got converted when we consolidated the PowerPoint, so we'll send the, the cleaner version of the PowerPoint slide um, as well so you can see the English slides. Um, I'm so happy that this worked out. So thank you all for, for being here and participating and presenting. And um, yeah, thank you. So that's it.
Great job. So thank you.